Now, I know what you're going to say, Steve. Why in the hell would I take a stimulant together with a calming agent? Well, it's very simple. If you do everything right, all of your neurotransmitters are upregulated and optimized, but you get stimulated in a very broad sense. So you need to narrow that so you could completely focus on the tasks that you need to perform for overall entrepreneurship and productivity reasons. L-theanine is the great balancer of all of these over-the-counter supplements to enhance neurotransmission, right? Allowing you to be highly focused, tunnel vision-like. Vigor Steve here with chapter two of part two of the Entrepreneur Nootropic Deep Dive video series. Unfortunately, after the pre-edit, I realized that the video was going to be way too long, one half hours in duration. So I decided to split part two into four different chapters. In chapter one, we discussed endorphins, encephalins, endocannabinoids, anandamide and gamma immunobutric acid as part of the mood and relaxation neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. And here in chapter two, we're going to discuss the motivation and productivity neurotransmitters and neuromodulators in the form of adenosine and acetylcholine. So without further ado, let's just get right into it. Starting with adenosine, which I already alluded to a couple times now, so let's not procrastinate any further and let's dive right into it. Adenosine is a neuromodulator, so not necessarily a neurotransmitter. It activates neuronal activity without actually transmitting signals itself. So it's similar to gamma immunobrutric acid or melatonin for that matter. But I felt that it was very important to include adenosine in this video because adenosine blockades increases wakefulness and overall energy levels throughout the day. Adenosine is one of the inhibitory neuromodulators that your body can secrete throughout the day or at bedtime. Right? Um, adenosine acts its inhibitory effects through the adenosine A1, A2A, A2B, and A3 receptors in the brain, regulating further neurotransmitter release and promoting an overall calming effect on neuronal activity. I would say that adenosine doesn't have such a potent inhibitory effect on neurotransmitter release compared to GABA and melatonin, which levels seem to rise predominantly in the evening, especially throughout the night, whereas adenosine already starts to rise during wakeful hours. And while you're awake, adenosine actually contributes to fatigue and the drive for sleep. So throughout the day, adenosine levels are moderately elevated. And then at night, GABA and melatonin kind of take over to inhibit further neurotransmitter uh, excitatory activity within the neurons. And besides that, adenosine has very potent vasodilating effects as well as neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory properties. Now, the vasodilating effects of adenosine mostly come from adenosine monophosphate or adenosine triphosphate, which actually converts into adenosine monophosphate within the bloodstream. It's AMP that causes the vasodilating effects predominantly. So this means that a balanced level of adenosine highly contributes to AMP and ATP synthesis, and it's the AMP and ATP that helps with cellular energy balance and energy transfer, allowing you to feel very energetic. So adenosine levels need to be nicely balanced, but you can block the adenosine receptor specifically with caffeine or something of the sort. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Adenosine also apparently interacts with the ghrelin slash a growth hormone secretagogue receptor, um, but doesn't really potentiate any actual growth hormone secretion, albeit that high levels of adenosine can also increase appetite. From uh, what I can piece together, uh, caffeine doesn't seem to interact with the ghrelin receptor, albeit that caffeine can have a blunting effect on appetite. So is that regulated through uh, activation or blockade of the ghrelin receptor or other pathways? Uh, it's probably worth of a deep dive, but I'm not going to include that here in this video about neurotransmitters. And while there are no direct dietary sources for adenosine, there are all several ways out there to modulate adenosine release and response within the brain. Symptoms of low adenosine levels include difficulty initiating sleep and increased neuronal excitability. Now, of course, melatonin and uh, gamma immunobutric acid, GABA, which I mentioned earlier, can offset low symptoms of adenosine or adenosine blockade, albeit that it's better not to have any adenosine receptor blockade in place when GABA and melatonin levels start to rise later on at night. And the levels or symptoms of high adenosine include excessive sleepiness, and sedation. So if you feel incredibly tired and unmotivated and just um, non-productive and sedated throughout the entire day, it might be that your adenosine levels are sky freaking high. So what can we do to optimize our adenosine levels? Bright sunlight exposure. 
As simple as that. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this many, many times in the Deep Sleep Deep Dive video series um, and to get the adequate amounts of sunlight exposure in as soon as you wake up, right? And whether you have those blinding curtains that slowly open or a uh, light that kind of slowly starts to increase its brightness, right? There's several models out there or you sleep with your curtains open and you just let the sun come up and wake you up that way. Um, probably the best thing you can do early in the morning is go outside and get some full body sunlight exposure for vitamin D synthesis and to bring your adenosine levels down and keep them modulated and somewhat suppressed throughout the day. Uh, of course, it's way easier just to have a cup of coffee because uh, caffeine uh, blocks the adenosine receptors, particularly through the adenosine A1 receptors, which further enhances acetylcholine release. Of course, acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter, which we'll get into after we finish this adenosine section. And caffeine is also able to temporarily increase epinephrine levels, which we're also going to get into a little bit later in this video. So by blocking the inhibitory effects of adenosine at the receptor site, directly increasing acetylcholine levels and epinephrine levels, caffeine acts as a stimulant. General recommendations include one cup of coffee in the morning and potentially in the afternoon or take one or two shots of espresso, whatever you prefer. And you can go the supplementation route, uh, let's say 100 to 200, maybe even 300 milligrams caffeine and hydrous from uh, supplements once or twice per day. Keep in mind that the half-life of caffeine is approximately five hours in, in healthy individuals. It might range between one and a half to nine and a half hours. So depending on your individual me metabolic rate of caffeine, um, don't take it too late in the day because you still want GABA and melatonin to help you fall asleep and of course, um, you know, give you a restful night so you can be highly productive the next day. So caffeine is meant to be respected. Take it maybe once or twice per day in combination with other neurotransmitter aids, which we'll discuss in this video, but don't overdo it. Right? Don't take it too late because you can't sleep. And if you can't sleep, you can be productive. Besides that, um, and this is going to make a, a comeback at a multitude of different neurotransmitter segments of this video, L-theanine, which is amino acid found in tea leaves, especially green tea. And it's known for its relaxing and calming effects. And it has a, a multitude of different effects on neurotransmitters, including adenosine. Now, I know what you're going to say, Steve, why in the hell would I take a stimulant together with a calming agent? Well, it's very simple. If you do everything right, all of your neurotransmitters are upregulated and optimized, but you get stimulated in a very broad sense. So you need to narrow that. And instead of having all of this excitatory action going on in your brain and being completely discombobulated, unable to really focus where to put all of this newfound energy, you need to narrow your field of vision and L-theanine does that directly by, kind of by balancing all of the neurotransmitters that are now being um, basically upregulated, right? So L-theanine basically narrows your vision so you could completely focus on the tasks that you need to perform for overall entrepreneurship and productivity reasons. And if you um, basically take this entire stack without the L-theanine, you'll find that you might be a little bit all over the place. So basically, long story short, I would say that L-theanine is the great balancer of all of these over-the-counter supplements to enhance neurotransmission, right? Allowing you to be highly focused, tunnel vision-like. So my recommendations would be to take L-theanine alongside many of these neurotransmitters, which we're going to discuss, 100 to 200 milligrams in the morning, and then another 100 to 200 milligrams in the evening, because if you don't take the excitatory um, aids, which we'll discuss in this video, right? The caffeine and uh, things to upregulate glutamate, for example, or norepinephrine, epinephrine levels. If you take L-theanine before bed and all of those upregulatory, excitatory neurotransmitter aids are not in place, then L-theanine can be quite sedating, especially in combination with GABA and melatonin. Moving over to acetylcholine, which is one of the most important neurotransmitters that we're going to discuss. In this video, acetylcholine contributes to muscular contraction, which is vital for voluntary movements and motor control. Acetylcholine contributes to slowing and modulating the heart rate, stimulating digestion and promoting a state of calm and well-being. Uh, of course, uh, acetylcholine contributes to cognitive processes like attention or memory formation is uh, implicated in very high brain functions. And uh, acetylcholine also contributes to the regulation of sleep-wake cycles. And besides that, similar to endorphins and endocannabinoids, acetylcholine contributes to pain modulation where it influences the pain perception in the spinal cord. Acetylcholine is primarily produced from dietary choline within the nerve cells 
there's an enzyme called choline acetyltransferase, which converts dietary choline into acetylcholine, which is, of course, primarily active in the central nervous system, especially in the brain. So this means that you can directly influence the levels of acetylcholine in the brain and central nervous system by increasing dietary choline intake. We'll get to that, don't worry. Symptoms of low acetylcholine levels include memory deficits, cognitive impairment, difficulty concentrating, and muscle weakness, while symptoms of high acetylcholine levels include muscle spasms, excessive salivating, and sweating, and even diarrhea. So again, we just try to balance the acetylcholine level so we can be highly cognitive, have good memory formation, have awesome, 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 awesome muscular contractions when we do go to the gym four or five times per week, but not to the point that we have muscle spasms or start to salivate excessively, which is not the best uh, scenario when you're trying to give presentations or make YouTube videos or do a long form podcast because you'd literally be foaming at the mouth. Okay, what can we do to optimize acetylcholine levels in the central nervous system and in the brain? You can follow a good diet and have a healthy gut microbiome. Um, so follow an elimination diet that uh, focuses on freshly cooked foods that are easy to digest and provide a broad load of various macro and micronutrients and containing a good amount of choline. So choline rich foods include egg yolks, whole eggs, beef liver, chicken liver, turkey liver, right? So whole eggs and liver is basically the way to go. Salmon, cod, tilapia, lean beef, lean pork, chicken breast, turkey breast, milk, yogurt, shrimp, other shellfish, peanuts, almonds, sunflower seeds, tofu, and soybeans, including Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and quinoa. So basically, if you want to upregulate your acetylcholine levels, just eat a little bit better, bro. And otherwise supplement with choline, which is the dietary precursor to acetylcholine, right? So um, we already went over the choline-rich foods, but you can supplement with choline, let's say 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams upon waking and before bed, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams um, supplemental choline alongside of the dietary choline that you get. And most diets, if you you know follow a general bro food diet with food that you prepare yourself, right? all the, uh, the lean protein sources and all of the healthy vegetables and nuts and seeds and, um, you know, maybe some uh, some dairy products here and there, or particularly yogurts, which is still good for digestion. And milk cheese might give you some pimples. So I would omit those, even though there are good sources for choline. So if your diet is balanced from all of the diets that are written over the couple of years where I actually track dietary choline intake, most people in the fitness industry would get approximately 1,000, 2,000, maybe even 3,000 milligrams of choline in per day simply from dietary sources. So if you supplement 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams choline from supplementation, that's, let's say, anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 milligrams of choline per day. Now, you're still uh, solely dependent on this enzyme, the choline acetyltransferase, to produce acetylcholine from the dietary choline that you're getting in. Um, so... We have uh, highly bioavailable sources for acetylcholine in this uh, acetylcholine production. We have alpha-GPC, one of my favorites. Alpha-GPC stands for alpha glycerophosphocholine. So there's a choline molecule in there somewhere. Alpha-GPC is the highest bioavailable source of choline, which acts as a precursor, duh, to acetylcholine. And has potential neuroprotective effects because a glycerophosphate contributes to the synthesis of cell membranes. So you get something, uh, a building block for acetylcholine for cognitive enhancement, and then also protect the cell membranes of your brain and the central nervous system. General recommendations uh, are anywhere from 300 milligrams to 1200 milligrams before cognitive tasks, right? So this is besides the dietary choline and the potential choline supplementation, which obviously also helps for liver health. Um, and then I would supplement with alpha-GPC once, two times, maybe even three times daily but preferably towards the lower end because most of the established dosages, which the dosage ranges which are on the screen are for solo administrations, but nobody does anything uh, solo, right? We're trying to optimize all of the neurotransmitters. So I would just uh, do something on the low end of all these recommendations and then uh, combine a multitude of different compounds, which is basically the same as a cookie cutter steroid cycle design, right? You combine a couple of different compounds together to elicit a synergistic effect. I would say that alpha-GPC is better than choline by tartrate or CDB choline, but let's just discuss them anyway. 
Uh, choline bitartrate has a moderate bioavailability of uh, choline and tartric acid. Of course, uh, this can also raise acetylcholine levels. General recommendations are anywhere between 500 to 1000 milligrams before cognitive tasks. And then there's CDB choline, which stands for cytidine diphosphate choline. I think there's a brand called acetylcholine out there, which contains CDB choline. Also highly bioavailable, albeit not to the extent uh, of the bioavailability that alpha GPC has. Of course, CDB choline is also broken down in the intestinal tract to release choline and citadine. Uh, choline is used as an acetylcholine precursor right, for synthesis, and citadine is converted into uridine, which is another nucleotide involved in brain function. I know what you're going to ask, Steve, what about uridine monophosphate? Don't worry, we'll get to that. So you might have an overlapping effect if you go with CDD, CDP choline instead of alpha GPC, and you uh, combine that or don't combine that with uridine 5 monophosphate. And CDP choline also has potential neuroprotective effects. General recommendations are a little bit higher than alpha GPC towards the lower end. I would say that a good effect is established from 500 milligrams to 1000 milligrams before cognitive tasks and up to three times daily. Keep in mind that alpha GPC, choline, uh, bitartrate, and CDB choline can all contribute to headaches and gastrointestinal discomfort. And a choline bitartrate specifically can cause a fishy body odor if you overdo it, right? So you have to going to um, right, make a decision, eat healthy first, maybe supplement with a little bit of uh, di uh, choline on top of your diet. And then towards the lower end of alpha GPC, I would start supplementing with once, maybe two times per day. That's a good start. You can always take more later on. Again, my favorite is Alpha GPC. I would um, prefer that one over choline by tartrate or CDB choline, but there's something to say for CDB choline because it, it contains uridine, albeit that you can just supplement with uridine 5-monophosphate, which again is a nucleotide that plays a crucial role in the synthesis of ribonucleic acid, RNA, and phospholipids in the brain. So it makes logical sense that if you take anabolic androgenic steroids, which has a lot of androgen-mediated gene transcription, RNA turnover, and protein expression, that you provide a crucial building block in the synthesis of RNA when a syn RNA synthesis is upregulated. So you get a lot of protein expression, but of course all of the neurological effects which are associated with RNA expression are upregulated and sustained as well. Now, besides contributing to acetylcholine synthesis in the brain, uh, uridine 5-monophosphate might also enhance dopamine secretion and indirectly influence serotonin levels and serotonin transmission, potentially contributing to mood regulation. Personally, I would say that uridine 5-monophosphate, besides L-theanine and alpha-GPC, are some of the key ingredients in this stack. You will definitely notice a huge boost in overall cognitive function, motivation, and mood, with a simple low dose of 200 to 400 milligrams uridine 5-monophosphate before cognitive task, maybe once or two times per day. I would say that 300 milligrams is certainly my favorite. But again, if you want to start low because you're going to combine a multitude of these, these different over-the-counter supplements, again, you can always build your way up. A side effect of uridine monophosphate, though, is insomnia, allergic reactions, and gastrointestinal discomfort if you overdo it. So if you go to um, 1,200 milligrams per day right off the start, um, some side effects are uh, to be expected. Now, again, these are just building blocks for acetylcholine, but acetylcholine still has to be formed besides the enzymatic reaction coming from acetyl, uh, what is it? Choline acetyltransferase, uh, vitamin B6, vitamin B9, and vitamin B12, iron, and magnesium to a certain extent, all contribute to the synthesis of acetylcholine. Again, I mentioned this already in several earlier parts regarding neurotransmitter synthesis, so I don't want to go over it too much in depth, right? I'll put all of the details on the screen. Vitamin B5 pentatonic acid is uh, important. I included all of the dietary sources. Uh, I would just stick with a general vitamin B50 complex, morning and evening, or a B100 complex if you prefer. I do feel it's important to supplement with a low dose of vitamin B6P5P, peroxidyl 5 phosphate because vitamin B6P5P is not only um, involved in the conversion of choline to acetylcholine, it also contributes to the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin, which we'll get into, the synthesis of gamma aminobutyric acid, which we already alluded to, dopamine, which we'll get into, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So uh, when it comes to neurotransmitter synthesis, vitamin B6P5P is bay, is king, 
the go-to be-all, end-all B vitamin that everybody should include in their stack alongside these neurotransmitter aids, whether those are precursors or modulators, right? I think it's very important that you supplement directly with a little bit of vitamin B6, P5, P, which differs from a regular vitamin B6, which is found in dietary sources, including turkey, chicken, salmon, tuna, trout, lean beef, lean pork, bananas, potatoes with the skin on. Apparently, most of the vitamin B6 is found in the skin. Avocados, sunflower seeds, pistachio nuts, prunes, raisins, brown rice, whole wheat, chickpeas, lentils, and black beans. So that's predominantly vitamin B6, which needs to be converted into a peroxidal 5-phosphate within the body, which can then contribute to acetylcholine synthesis. And vitamin B6, P5P is also involved in the synthesis and breakdown of histamine, which we're also going to get into. So again, uh, P5P, let's say 10 to 25 milligrams alongside your uh, neurotransmitter aids. And it can be 10 to 75 milligrams P5P total per day. And again, if you eat healthy for adequate vitamin B6 intake, and you take a general uh, a vitamin B50 complex morning in your evening or a vitamin B100 complex in the morning, I feel that you get adequate amounts of vitamin B6, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have adequate levels of vitamin B6 peroxidyl 5 phosphate, which contributes to neurotransmitter synthesis. So it makes logical sense to supplement with a little bit. I think that 10 milligrams per serving gets the job done, but uh, most over-the-counter formulas are like uh, 20, 25 milligrams or some are even 100 milligrams. A low dose goes a very long way. Again, vitamin B9 folate contributes, uh, vitamin B12 contributes to acetylcholine production or at least uh, contributes to choline methylation, which is a step in the production of acetylcholine. Uh, most people would get adequate amounts of vitamin B12 from dietary sources or a B50 or B100 complex. Iron also plays a crucial role in the synthesis of acetylcholine as well as dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, gamma immunobutric acid, glutamate, encephalins, and endorphins. Um, so it makes logical sense to make sure you have a diet with a good amount of iron. Doesn't mean you have to eat a boatload of beef and go full carnivore, right? Beef only every single day uh, to the point you get iron overload. Food rich in hema iron obviously includes beef, lamb, pork, liver, chicken, um, especially the darker meats of chicken and turkey and salmon, tuna, sardines, clams, oysters, mussels and shrimp. So I would say just eat healthy, maybe add in a little bit of beef, liver and steak to your diet. But if you take anabolic angiogenic steroids at higher concentrations, you don't want to overdo the iron because otherwise your hematocrit red blood cells and the hemoglobin concentration will go up quite a bit. So now you need to donate blood and right, we go into this roller coaster of over donations and uh, supplementation to keep everything balanced. So a balanced diet will probably get the job done, include a little bit of beef liver and steak if you have to. And otherwise, if you're drug free, um, and you're iron deficient, right? Which you can see on your serum iron levels, maybe supplement for a while with 18 to 36 milligrams iron ferrous bisglycinate morning and evening, right? But ideally you split up the dose, so 18 milligrams in the morning, 18 milligrams in the evening. Now, again, like I alluded to before, the side effects of high iron levels are polycythemia, impaired zinc or copper absorption, which is uh, particularly the case if you overdo the iron supplements. And uh, the iron supplements can also cause constipation. So I would rather lean towards a little bit more beef liver and steak with your diet. And then if iron levels are sufficient, you'll see that red blood cell count, hematocrit, hemoglobin concentrations are just perfectly normal, as well as the synthesis of all of these neurotransmitters that iron contributes to. Omega-3 fatty acids, particularly uh, DHA, supports acetylcholine release within the brain. So you can eat uh, salmon, mackerel, sardines, herring, anchovies, trouts, albacore, tuna, free-range whole eggs, chia seeds, flax seeds, flaxseed oil, walnuts, hemp seeds, edamame, and seaweed, all reasonably high in omega-3s, but you can just go with the over-the-counter supplement, obviously. 500 to 800 milligrams EPA and DHA from fish oil, with meals, so that's 2,500 milligrams to 4,800 milligrams EPA and DHA per day. Start low, build your way up because uh, uh, you know fish oil can also contribute to um, thinning the blood and it has very potent anti-inflammatory properties. So you might not want to overdo it right off the start and it really depends on your overall energy expenditure, the demand that you have in your body and what else you're eating and supplementing with. Now, we already mentioned caffeine, which blocks the adenosine receptors, especially the A1 adenosine receptors, which then concurrently enhances acetylcholine release. 
So that's something you can look into if you want to upregulate the acetylcholine levels within your brain. And then there's ginkgo biloba, ginkgo extract made from the leaves of the ginkgo tree. Ginkgo biloba is known to increase blood circulation in the brain, so don't combine that with nisergoline, which also increases blood circulation to the brain, but we'll discuss that drug interaction when we get to uh, consecutive parts of the Entrepreneur Nootropic Deep Dive video series, right? probably part three or four. Uh, ginkgo biloba has antioxidant properties and inhibits platelet aggregation. So if you want to combine ginkgo biloba with fish oil, a little bit of caution is advised, especially if you combine it with aspirin, right? There's some drug interactions here, so please do your due diligence before you start supplementing with ginkgo biloba. Um, ginkgo biloba increases acetylcholine levels and dopaminergic neurotransmission, lowering adrenergic neurotransmission. So there's a little bit of an overlap with caffeine there. And ginkgo biloba might increase, albeit that the evidence is a little bit thin, increase serotonin uptake and thus lowering the positive effect that serotonin has in the brain. Personally, I never experienced that because I'm on top of my serotonergic neurotransmission precursors, which we'll get into. That's the L-tryptophan and the 5-HTP. Um, but I would say the ginkgo biloba is pretty low on the priority list of upregulating neurotransmission. Still, general recommendations uh, are anywhere between 120 to 240 milligrams before cognitive tasks, up to three times daily. Again, keep it towards the lower end, especially um, if you do other stuff that might cause drug interactions. Side effects of ginkgo biloba are uh, bleeding risks, headaches, dizziness, allergic reactions, gastrointestinal discomfort. And again, ginkgo biloba might interact with blood thinning medications, anticonvulsants, and antidepressants. So a little bit additional research is required, I would say, albeit that low dosages of ginkgo biloba are reasonably benign and just gives you this increased acetylcholine levels and dopaminergic neurotransmission. Bacopa monieri, also known as Brahmi, which contains bacocytes, and it's these bacocytes that have potential mood and cognitive enhancing effects, as well as antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and neuroprotective properties. The bacocytes are thought to enhance neuronal communication by promoting the growth of dendrites and synapses, and it might raise acetylcholine levels by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase, which is an enzyme that would otherwise break down acetylcholine. And Pacopa monary might also prevent the depletion of dopamine and serotonin associated with chronic stress. So I feel that Pacopa monary is more of an adoptogen than directly contributes to acetylcholine levels, albeit that, of course, Pacopa monary might inhibit acetylcholine esterase and thus raise acetylcholine levels in the brain. It's something to look into, albeit that I'll be the first one to say that the evidence on Pacopa monary thin thin, but it's a reasonably new compound. Maybe there hasn't been uh, so many studies performed on this compound. And later on, as we continue in our nootropic journey, more evidence starts to surface that Bacopa monieri is the go-to nootropic out of all the nootropics which we're discussing. Uh, general recommendations are anywhere between 300 to 600 milligrams before cognitive tasks. Again, up to three times per day, albeit that higher dosages, higher intake is associated with fatigue, nausea, and gastrointestinal discomfort. And then the last one to optimize and enhance acetylcholine levels within the brain, Euperzine A, also known as Euperzia serrata extract, which is derived from Chinese club moss, which also inhibits acetylcholine esterase, which again would otherwise break down acetylcholine. So if you have one option to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, instead of going with Bacopa monieri, I would go with Euperzine A, and not combine them together. General recommendations for Uprazine A are 50 micrograms to 200 micrograms alongside choline-containing supplements. So if you go with a regular choline supplementation or alpha-GPC or CDB choline or choline by tartrates, uh, I would recommend to supplement with a little bit of Uprazine A to prevent the breakdown of acetylcholine, which ultimately are being raised through these choline supplement precursors. The side effects of Uprazine A are pretty severe, so Caution is advised, start low, you can always build your way up, especially if you combine uh, choline-containing supplements with Uperzine A at, at higher dosages. Side effects are uh, nausea, diarrhea, insomnia, or muscle cramps. Keep in mind that Uperzine A can interact with some Alzheimer's medications, anticholinergic medications, muscle relaxants, cholinergic agonists, beta blockers, NMDA receptor antagonists, blood thinners, so caution is advised, right? I, mean, I know that Uprazine A is uh, over the counter and contained with some nootropic formulas, uh, but I would keep the dose low just as a preventative measure because again, as you see, there's some drug interactions. And if you're on a boatload of fish oil, which has blood thinning effects 
and uh, which one was it? Uh, ginkgo biloba extract, which has blood thinning effects. Uh, there might be some overlap there. So take it easy. So to summarize, if you want to increase your acetylcholine levels, eat healthy. And besides that, supplement with alpha GPC, supplement with uridine 5 monophosphate, supplement with vitamin B6, P5P, and upercine A once or twice per day. And the cognitive benefits that you get out of that, sweet, double sweet, I promise you. All right, guys, let's wrap it up here for now. In chapter three of part two of the Entrepreneur Nootropic Deep Dive video series, we're going to discuss dopamine, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline, glutamate, and histamine, which have some interconnection because they promote wakefulness and alertness and contribute to mood and motivation. I'll link all of them down below as soon as these chapters are dropping. I'll link them at the end of this one when the next chapter is already released. Feel free to watch them at your own leisure. You like serialized content, but you don't like waiting. You're a Netflix baby. Just wait until our four chapters have been released and then you can watch them back to back one half hour straight. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. A linked discount code to all of the supplements which we're discussing in the Entrepreneur Nootropic Deep Dive Part 2, four chapters, right? Links are down below. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A neurotransmission enhanced, highly productive front double bicep for you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next chapter, dropping next week. Peace out.